Hi, and welcome to the Rugby Bits pod. Yo, we've got plenty to go through, but um, at the moment, I'm joined by Cooks. Hi, man. How are you doing? Hey, Shotley. Hey, everyone. Um, I feel like I, I, I'm more of a guest now on the pod than, 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 than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm all good, thanks. How are especially, you, bro? Especially because you... Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Especially because you're recording out of yet another hotel room. How's, how's this hotel treating you? Yeah, this is another one back in East London, back in the roots where um, I was born in East London. So um, it's nice to sort of, sort of, sort of ah. be back. But now I'm, I'm reliant on Eastern Cape um, Wi-Fi and a load, ske- a load shedding schedule, which I have no idea when will switch me off. So it's I can for the whole part or half a part. So who knows? Yeah, well, I, I mean, we were chatting earlier and mine, um, mine was supposed to be off between 2 and 4.30 and it just didn't go off. So <laughs> I think we're kind of both in the same space. So. Um, how was your weekend? What you get up to? Weekend was very good, thanks. Um, Saturday, I didn't watch much rugby because I just spent time with my missus and her friends because they organized a bride that still the two while the Stormers and Sharks were playing. And then, <laughs> yeah, so no, rag- no live rugby or anything. Um, the only live games I did catch a super rugby, but I had to catch up. I had to catch up for this morning and this or well, this morning is later in on Sunday. So I didn't watch much rugby, which is frustrating, but I did make sure I pick a weekend that was no Six Nations, so which was which was good. But and how's your weekend? Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Um yeah, I, I was I watched a little bit of Ruggers this weekend, did some work. I did go for a rather challenging trail run on Saturday. Um I thought it was a ten. Um, and I run, I run little 10 Ks around my house or eight, eight to 10 K runs. And they're obviously relatively easy because this, this one I got stuck into was, was nice and easy on the eyes, but not so easy on the legs. Um, and then I was just about, I don't know, like with seven and a half, eight Ks, maybe just a touch over eight Ks in. And I could see the starting point, you know, in the distance, you know, that w- where, you know, you're going to be go where you can, <laughs> where you know, you're going to be finishing. And as I came up, I was like, cool, I've got to bang a left and then I'll run those sort of two-ish Ks and finish up the, the routes. And as I got up to the top, the arrow was pointing to the right. And that's when it dawned on me that I was probably running a 12K. So, yeah, that was, oh, geez, sure. I'll tell you, uh, interesting, <laughs> interesting <laughs> mental conversations because, you know, the legs get very heavy very quickly and your mind's like, no, dude, just, just jump a fence. Do, <laughs> do something else. Just finish this thing up. So, 100 yeah. stopped oh, no, at 10Ks but... and, and wait for a helicopter to come pick me up. I'm not running more than that. I've told my body I'm running 10. <laughs> Just... this, there's no more. Like, someone's going to fetch me one oh, way or no. another, but I'm not, I'm not running. I'll walk I walk it back after two hours, but I'm not running it. Yeah, no, I, I was, yeah, it was interesting. But anyway. But yeah, that was the, the low light of my weekend is probably the right way of putting it. But, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it, was, it was good. It was good, man. Um, so Tyler's joining us a little bit late. He's having some technical issues. Um, so I think wh- what we'll do is we'll jump straight in and um, I, will, uh, I will try and guide things until the big boss comes back. But um, I think it's only right and, and obviously fun to get started off with this week's first phase. And um, what a cracking first phase. It was actually Tyler's idea was such a, such a great one. But we all have players that we think will become the best thing ever. So even through the ups and downs and injuries and all that sort of, uh, all that sort of stuff, we have that one player that we'll never give up on. And uh, we had some incredible responses here. So um, Rugby Sales Sharks, the Rugby United account in, in, uh, in the UK, I assume they're based in the UK. I could be wrong, but uh, um, they said James O'Connor. Now, there's a great one to start off with. I mean, James O'Connor, like especially young, um, young talented players, like you often sit with them long and hard. So we got a lot of those, like those young stars that came through. So James O'Connor was one, Johan Khorsen, Jan Saffontaine, um, Ngani Lamape, Jacques Duplessis, Marcel Kutsir. Um, there was a great one from uh, Andre Gil, who's a a long time listener and great supporter of the rugby bits. Um, one of our, our top dirt trackers, but he goes Murray Todger and Owen Farrell, but there's a couple of uh, little cheeky grins after that. JD Schickeling, Francois Hochart, Marcel Kutsir. Oh, this is a great one from Martin Prinzler. Um, Tondi Shivanga. Now, 
there's a guy who I thought would get a hell of a lot more game time than than he did, especially after the start he had. Eh, Cooks? Yeah, how soon you? It's a tough to score six tries in debut and then never play for box again. I mean, that's a, that, it's still a fresh try great in world rugby. But yeah, I mean, oh, he was blitz back in back in the days. Him and Egan seconds on the wing. Yeah, I yeah. Like, remember or Shavani. Yeah, you are, oh. that's, a, that's a fantastic, fantastic shot. Yeah. Some other really good ones, Innocent Radebe, um, Lungelo Gosa, uh, Jake and Jason Jenkins, Garth April's another one. Um, sheesh, there, oh, there's so many. So just thanks to everyone who, who got involved. It's so great getting so much, so much return. Um, Cooks, who is your man? Who's, who's your guy you'll never give up on? Do you know what? Uh, uh, I put it on Twitter. I've got a, I've got a couple. I, went, I put it on Twitter and I said, France, I mean, uh, Ron Pinot at 10. I, I will, I'll, I'll never give up on an argument that he could have been our greatest. At 10? Ever eh? 10. I, I, I was with PJV all the way when he said he's a Tiger Woods of rugby at 10. I still remember that very first test against the Lions where he was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Just, it's just his cold kicking he started, down. He started two, maybe three, yeah? Yeah, I started the second His test. His goal kicking then, wasn't that bad. Things it wasn't as it bad wasn't as that bad. Minutes, but, and, and obviously, he never good but game. But then, when you're up against Mornay Stan, you're never going to look good. And that's you know. the thing. I, mean, I think I think Mornay Stan had a phenomenal career as Springbok ten, but it just felt like, man, I guess that. But we're on better still. The most balanced ten, just a ball, we kick at everything. We lost that on him. I said in the group, uh, Yaku Tauta. I still remember that to the 2011 young Lions side that ripped the shocks. A part of the Tree Levy Curry Cup. And him and, and, and then I mentioned now Jesse Krill. Uh, Jesse Krill didn't get injured. I still think we lost a great fullback in Jesse Krill when Heineken made him, when Heineken made him move into a full time 30. I still, to this day, yeah. when, I, when I have Jesse Krill chats, I go, that's a fullback. That's a, him and Yago Tato, two great fullbacks that we, when, whenever Yago Tato was through injuries, Jesse Krill was through a position switch. I, uh, I went back and watched the highlights of Jesse Kuhl when he made his Bulls debut playing a fullback, just ripping the Hurricanes apart. And we just never got to see it again. I mean, Talon saw it, saw it at school level and the things that Jesse could do at 15. Oh, but that's my guys. I'll, I'll probably say Yaku Tauta and Ron Bidon are the, are the guys I'll, I'll never give on to injuries. I thought that would be special. Just Ron Bidon at 10 and Yaku Tauta at 15. Yeah, what a, what a great time to, to welcome Tyler. Uh, Tyler, we're just about wrapping up the podcast. We had a, we had a great show. Um, hi, you, mate. No, I think I'm sure it's a high quality <laughs> podcast if you guys were the only two speaking on it. So I'm very happy with that. I'm looking forward to listening to everything. Sheesh. Blushing. <laughs> no, um, if I can add. How, uh, who, who's, your, who's your guy? Who's yeah, your just guy? quickly on the Jesse Creel thing. I, yeah, I, I think maybe a next um, first phase question is Springboks that you think were played out of position. So Creel would be top of my list. Um, yeah, as Cook said, in high school, he, at 15, he was just amazing. And I thought that was the best use of his defensive and running skills. And he also has a good kicking boot. Pat Lambie should have been a 15 as well. Um, and that just never happened. And obviously, I'm a big, I'm probably the, 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 the leader of the, Andre Pollard is a, could have been like a world-class 12 um, club as well. Um but my actual answer is Wesley Fofana. I think if Wesley Fofana was fit right oh, now, what a and shot. if he was able to play the 100 of test um, oh. career that he was actually supposed to, he would have been like just the final touch in this French team. So he'd be 35 right now. So obviously, you know, he isn't really in his prime, but imagine him next to Gelf, this Gael Fiku. I mean, he did play with Gael Fiku, obviously, when he was That's young. what I... It would just be an irresistible. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, like imagine he he was front and center starting and doing his Fafana stuff while Fiku was coming in. We'd have we'd have had Fiku growing with them together. The two of them would have been incredible. And they probably would have interchanged between mm. twelve and thirteen countless times. So can I ask a question? Isn't Wesley Fofana playing for Chelsea now, if I'm not mistaken? <laughs> Every time <laughs> I see it. It always throws me off. For some moment, I'm like, wait, what? It always throws me off. Like, Lester did me so dirty when they brought him in. And it was also confusing because it was Lester. So I was like, why is Fofana playing for the Leicester Tigers? 
<laughs> okay, my last little uh, my last little little close off as mini host before Tyler <laughs> takes over. I'm gonna give you give you mine. So I was I was really I was really torn between these two players, but the one that started this all off was this weekend. I don't know why I was, I was watching a bit of rugby and um, I I was just thinking about Howard Nisi, and I was thinking to myself how excited I was to watch him play rugby when he when he came onto the scene um and to and I, I looked at him and i thought this this guy is going to be he's going to be good he's going to be a springbok i thought he was going to be a solid a solid springbok 12 i thought he could add value uh, all over and it just never took off and every time he came back from from injury i was like cool this is now's his chance and then moved to a different club or union and i, I just kept thinking that every time he came back, you know, he was going to fulfill what, what, what I thought would, would happen. I mean, that's just selfish to be fair, but uh, I thought he would, he would take steps up. My other one, Italian midfielder, is Michele Campagnaro. <laughs> uh, I, I watch Italy play rugby now, and I'm like, I'm like, shit, he would absolutely destroy people in this current Italian attacking setup. He, Firstly, I think he's probably one of the best outside centers Italy have ever had if he could have just stayed fit and in favor and in the mix. I, I really rate him. But in, in this attacking sort of shape and platform that the Italians are using, he would have ripped people to shreds. Um, so, so, yeah, he's, the, those two are, are my guys. Uh, un, unlike me to pick a midfield, but, um, but yeah. And, and uh, Hardem Nisi, whew, man, w- what a beast of a player. I thought you were going to pick Rico Ioanni as a midfielder, honestly, so I'm quite surprised at that. Um, uh, <laughs> that's for rugby. F- that's for the first phase where we pick rugby fast. <laughs> um, another one that I just thought about is players from maybe 10 or 20 years ago that you think would fit in like great in like international teams when you're talking about um, Capagnaro now. I think that would also be quite an interesting discussion. Um, but I think let's move on. There's been a lot of rugby over this weekend and obviously rugby to come as well. Can, Sean? Tala, sorry. Can I, I I'm, I'm going to try really hard to get his name right, but I, I'm not sure if you guys remember uh, someone I actually, um, uh, I, I watched him play against Hammies, but he played for Arkies and um, I can't remember where he went to school, but Lichelli Zoli, Zoli, he was a, he was a center. And he signed for the Cheaters. Do you guys remember watching him in Varsity Cup? I remember Lichelle Kuli. I played when I was in a 21 at the Kings, he was in a 19. And um, the Kings was in Andrews. I think it was in Andrews. And then for the Kings, we went to, um, to, to, to Ike's. Yeah, for the used to rip it up. Absolutely rip it up. And he could play. Mate, you knew he was a proper player. I watched, I watched him play. And then I attended a, um, a coaching clinic where he came from Ike's to coach at a uh, school level. I think it was Rhonda Bosch. He coached, did a session with them. And, uh, I was, I, I was, I loved the way he approached like defending and attacking, um, in the midfield. And he was an outside center. I loved the way he did it. I loved the way that he coached it as well. And then I watched a lot more of him and I, he was, he's a guy that I thought was going to take the step up. Um, and he never got picked properly for province properly. Um, he didn't get a, a, like a good look in and then he made the move to the cheaters. And I, I don't think I ever saw him play for the cheaters, but there's a guy that, that I thought was, was brilliant. He's, he was big, he was solid, he was quick. And, um, like I said, like I love the way he 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 focused on and how he looked at and the things that he that he tried to express on on the field. So shit, but yeah, Flipper, what a beast! I think yeah, and just quickly on how Nisi, I think he was just. I remember when the Lions had him and Ron Janssen van Rensburg, and it was a matter of matching which one and and using both of them sometimes yes. as well. And that was just such an entertaining um combination. Um outside of usually Alton Nikes as well. Like, yeah, I think there's probably a lot of players in that like Lions 2010s team that would fit this category as well. Brilliant. Okay, Tyler, you, I'm going to hand the baton over, mate. You, you can take control. Okay, so I've, I'm, now, I'm now standing at 10 and I'm calling the shots now. I'm going to call a few sextant loops and, 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 and the sword for the next few phases. So let's start with the URC. 
we've um a, yeah a very very engrossing weekend of URC rugby and some major playoff implications and we start with the South African derbies so we'll start with the Stormers win 29 23 against the Sharks in Cape Town and Sean I'll start with you um I think we discussed this on the group that you know the Stormers without their Springboks because these are the two teams that are most affected by the Springbok camp happening right now the Stormers without their Springboks still look like the Stormers, like still look like the the defending champions, while the Sharks without their Springboks look like, you know, the College Rovers. Um, and Sean, I think that's pretty much the big difference between these two teams, even though the Sharks did do well to come back in the game late on. Yeah, it's I I, I look at the score, 29-23 to the Stormers, and I'm just like, that doesn't, it still doesn't compute. Like it doesn't make sense because the Stormers were way better than that. The fact that the Sharks made a, a, a comeback is very interesting. And I didn't, I only watched the game once. I didn't watch it twice. So I wasn't really a, able to have a proper little look see at it. But it's the same thing as last year, obviously, with not as many Springboks lis, uh, m- listening, missing. The, the, the Sharks are just disjointed. And it's weird. Like, they, it doesn't seem like um, Neil Powell's been able to make that impact. And, to be honest, if I think back now when Powell went into the sevens, they didn't make a massive, massive like impact. He's not the uh, the the Michael Chaker shakeup coach. He's a foundation built for many, many years to come kind of a coach. So maybe he hasn't had enough time. And obviously, John Plumtree is very likely to rejoin the Sharks. I see on socials at the moment. So um, Powell's obviously trying to get everything in place. But we would have expected something to be different already, and it's not happening. And it's quite crazy thinking about what the Sharks, realistically, the Sharks are in a heap of shit. Um, They are currently seventh, and they have to finish seventh, hopefully sixth. You know, well, seventh, they have to, they can't finish eighth because um, the Welsh Shield will take that eighth spot. So the Sharks are in serious danger of missing out on Champions Cup rugby next year, which is huge um, financially and for the players. Um, and obviously, they want to be pushing for, um, you know, like make make a proper statement. So they're going to have to now balance what they're going to do. They can't be in a real safe space in in the URC where they get to focus on the six uh, six nations on the ch- on the Champions Cup because um, they're in the playoffs. You know, they're going to have to start juggling and then you've got to juggle in a World Cup year when you can only play book players a certain amount of times. But it's the craziest thing. The Sharks without their spring box are, are what you say, like they're like a club side and the Sharks with their spring box are a side that could probably be 12th in the world if they played international rugby just as a club, you know. So it's, it's weird and I don't really have an answer. Cooks, just going to, I think now your number one love, the Stormers, and your favorite coach in the world, John Dobson. You know, I think it's a big credit that the Stormers have now swept the the, the whole South African conference and have now officially won the South African Shield. They haven't lost a, a South African derby, and actually they haven't lost a South African derby since December 2021 and haven't lost a match at home in Cape Town since December They're Grand 2021. Slam, eh? The Stormers are clearly yeah, the grand, standard. The South the African complete Africans, Grand yeah. Slam. Crazy. Yeah. Love it. And yeah, cooks. I think, yeah, I think it's just a testament of what the Stormers are building there. The John Dobson uh, Springboard coach agenda is agending, as I'd like to say, as I've <laughs> tried to, to put the word out there. And, um, <laughs> the more you can tell her you, that what you just said in there about the Stormers and John Dobson, that's the case that he needs to present. That snippet that you should, you must, you must present that to Soru before they need to apply for the bulk job and you'll get the hands down. But, um, but tell like, yeah, I think the Stormers, I mean, they've just shown since December or January of last year what they've, what they've been able to put together, the structures they've put together, where the biggest testament to them is when they actually all that they spring box, they sort of still seem like a wild old machine. Nothing changes. Even like, you look, you look at them on the weekend when they were down by two, those two yellow cards and the Stormers and the Sharks fight back, you're thinking, oh, geez, they could, they're, they're about to throw this away, but they still find a way to close that game out. They still find ways to win games. And now they've, they've gone from, I mean, you, you, if you remember a year ago, we're still doubting what they form is. We're like, oh, wait, maybe they put a couple of games together, string a few wins. We'll see, we are, we'll see how they go to a year later to 
yeah. to, to be the standard bearers in, in South African rugby. I mean, if, the, when the new season started, they just they haven't then take, taken their foot off the gas. So I think it's an incredible job from Dobo and all the coaches and the players. You know, I mean, how many guys have stepped up? And, and all, there's all those guys in a, in a good side that said, but the Dan Duplessis have gotten better. Whenever Rickus Pretorius played last week, he got better. Sasha 12 came in and he was good. They've lost Daimani. They still, they still play better. At a stage, I mean, Paul David was, was out and Roger Jacobs was out and, and Ungra comes and steps in. So they've, they just got guys coming in and churning out performances week in, week out. So I feel like they're in such a good place and, and can potentially go and defend the URC, knowing that they at least have the, the Champions Cup spot secured and the player spot secured. The player spot secured. I, I have a question for both of you or not a question, maybe just the discussion, but around that Van Cock yellow card, what, what are your thoughts on all that shit that happened? I don't, yeah, I, I didn't have much of an issue with it. I thought, I thought it was a bit overblown, sort of the, the reaction to it. Or, yeah, maybe, Sean, you should go, well, go for like, it first. I don't, I don't know if there was any foul play there at all if, by Van Cock. If there's, like, if Faree dives on a player over the line. So he's gone for the ball. So mm, maybe that was warranted in that you could, you could say, cool, it wasn't a dive on the player. But then he tries to steal the ball. So if technically if he's over there trying to steal the ball, he should technically, someone should be allowed to clear out. And it's not like Van Cork went in and did a massive clean out. He grabbed him around the waist and pulled him off. And then it kicked off. Like there's no yellow card there. There's no far play. Like he's basically got yellow carded. But he's... For starting it though, isn't it? How how do then how then how did Fari not start it? How how did how did Cook start it though? I think for clearing like, Fari off the ball. Yeah, for like almost like throwing him off. I mean, I, it's kind of he didn't throw him off. He cleared him out. Yeah, I think it's like kind, that, that's my thing. I don't understand. You know, I, I think it's kind of, and we're going to talk about it later. The Adi Severe thing, or pre throat slit, where. I think he was just sort of doing what he was supposed to do, but I think the ref will obviously see that in a, in a bad light when a fight then kicks off. Yeah, I just find it really odd. It just was, it baffled me. Coxie. I think what, the one thing that, that one of the things that really irks me at the moment is that thing of players diving on someone after they score a trap. That's going to be a card immediately. That's going to get out. That's going to be like taking out the game because I half agree with you. I'm agree with you saying it. Free diving on with a blade, it does trigger cops to pull him away and it does create um, a, massive, a massive fight. But I mean, I don't know. It's like, yeah, like, it does seem like Cock is, is responding to, you know, Cock is responding to, to what Free did. So now the question is there. I thought if you send a card, you said both off. That's, if you're gonna if you're gonna give a card, then surely both would have had, would have had to go off. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's uh, it was just one of those things that disturbed me. Yeah, so it's pretty clear the Stormers are the best South African side in the URC. But Cooks, your your thoughts on the Sharks and and what's happening or what's going on? Any individuals you want to chat about? Yeah, I think I think. Um... Yourself and Tully hit the nail on the head is the fact that it's with the Sharks, it seems like there's two different teams at the moment. And um, yeah, I think for them, they've got to first find a way to bridge the gap between when the box are there and they're not there. I think the big difference with the Sharks and the Storm is the Storm, as you can tell, they have spent a lot more time together. So for them, obviously losing someone like a Damien Williams and, and, um, and, a, and a Kitsoff and a Frozen Elbow. Do you remember the glass of Kitsoff and Frozen Elbow played the exact amount of games last year? And they've played now, so the likes of uh, Nedley for sure. They've, they've played nonstop. They, they, they've been playing in a system. Amani Lopoka stayed behind. He's been playing in a system with Dobo. So with the Sharks, where it seems like a lot of those players are new. So in the box, it seems like a whole new different side. So then when they're not there, the likes of Yao Ping, they have to play. They haven't played right in weeks. So I guess thrashed in the starting lineup. But I must, the, the, it's, it's still impressive the way the Sharks came back. I thought Ron Jansen was an absolute beast. Every time he carried the ball, I mean, especially for the tribe. The big spark was Grant Williams. I thought he was absolutely phenomenal. I think obviously there's a big set about his past key game. That's something that he can add on. I think I look at what his pace is. So as I think, yeah, oh, that look of the bench is such a weapon and it's 
such a great break, but it's just nice to know that you know, someone like Grant Williams was probably outside of the top three in, for the boxes against that, that box set up in terms of the night that might go to the World Cup. But if you're leaving, like, if, if the, if the scars the likes of Grant Williams aren't making the, the box side, I mean, I think it shows a, a, a scrum of depth is in a, in a good place. I thought it was phenomenal. And so now there's a fantastic defender just, just steps in out like that. We, we actually to trip him is an amazing right. feat. That was, that was proper, proper Got feat. done. I think he's still, I mean, we can call him the pretzel for the next week. He really got, like, folded. Um, agree totally. Um, Grant Williams is, is class, got a great pass, makes good decisions. And honestly, the only issue is, 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 is his box kicking. And the issue with his box kicking is probably three meters, <laughs> three, maybe five meters. It's a, a, a distance thing. So that needs to be fixed. But, you know, if we're going to be very honest, um, we've seen Fuff do that. We've seen Hendrix do that. We've seen a lot of our nines not kick well. It's it's a growing pain. It's almost like it's almost like our hookers in a lineout issue. It's a, it's something that it's almost like a rite of passage. You know, you we're so heavily focused on it that uh, you 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 get exposed heavily when you get it wrong. Class player, Maher- um, brilliant. The other thing, sorry, that was hundred percent. It's like because we. I think the reason why in South Africa it's so focused on because there's a lot of fans who aren't, who don't understand the value that's boss kicking. So they're always quick to sort of, when it doesn't work, they go, yeah, you see this boss kicking doesn't work. So they're always quick to, people, there's a lot of people trying to quickly turn it down and be but like, the, yeah, that, it's an accuracy thing. Kicking. And, and it's, not yeah, it's, because an thing. it's not because, it's not because it's a shit game plan. It's because it's not being executed properly. So when a nine gets it wrong, people are quick to jump on their boat. It's like, we always make that chirp about Fuff, but Fuff declare. I can tell within the first two kicks how Fuff's King game is going to go. If the first two are pretty much spot we on, know 100%. it's going to be a long day for the position. And I could just kind of see it. That's how he and is. And the same with Pollard. No, 100%. It's the, same, it's the same with Pollard. Like we know the Springboks, when the, when, when those, we know those first two kicks from either one of them or whoever's starting at nine and 10, we know what's going to happen. Um, it's, uh, yeah, she. <laughs> It's so true. It's so true. Sorry, Cooks, for interrupting. No, 100%. And the thing is, for me, is you look at somebody, Aaron Smith, who's one of the, who's one of the best nines of, 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 of a all time. He's also up and down this kicking game. You look, you look at someone like TJ Perinara, no one gives him, his kicking game is, is, is dark red, but we, but he is after, we love the fact that he scores the tries, amazing running game. We love that. We praise it. But with our nines, we sought to tear them down because the key, they, they, like the they kicking ability is not as good as Econo Murray or, or Ben Young, the song guys are very, very accurate. And I, I, I think myself, like, are you, are you upset at the nine and kicking on him because you like the game plan or are you say he's not as good a kicker? I don't think Corona's kicking game is, is that bad. It's, it's just done maybe as good as a Fuff, Jaden Hendricks. Um, yeah. That's, that, 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 that's for me is the big difference. And like, if you look at someone like Fuff, the way he kicks is unique to any nine in the world. Not, no one brings that, that, that fucking game. No, no nine can do it. So it's so hard to compare the two. But yeah, I'm a massive Claude Williams fan. And I've got mm. a tangent of box kicks. Clearly, I'm getting my rugby. My yeah. my rugby I'm, I'm getting rugby mode again. Yeah, exactly. And i tell you, the, the, the other thing that I absolutely want to pull my hair out about fans is they're like, when a, you're a starting 9 and 10 player, they're like, oh, this is terrible. And then when the subs come on, they're like, this is how we want you to play. You're like, listen here, bro. They have different game plans. That's the whole point of it. You've got a 9 coming off the bench. He's probably going to run more and kick less, probably, you know. And then the next week, they, they, they'll start like the bench and you're like, oh, this is because he played better. Then he starts kicking again. They're like, no, what's going on? He's a shit player. You're like, come, guys. Like, it's pretty evident what's happening. Anyway, I also went on a tangent, but the one thing that I do want to talk about um, in the in the sharks uh, in the sharks setup is the unfortunate loss of Apalela Fassi, who doesn't look like we're going to see him again in the next month or two, and that's purely a guesstimation on the type of injury that I thought that I kind of think he had. He just didn't look comfortable. So, do you do you think he was making his way back into contention? He was playing a little bit. He was a little bit uh, a little bit. Better inform more game time. Yeah, I thought he was getting better week in week out. I mean, the more he was playing, the better he looked. Just so bleak that he got injured again. I think obviously injuries have 
have, have not now. been kind to you, man. man. Like, and mm-hmm. it, it, it almost feels like a player fast at the moment. He gets injured as soon as he gets back into form. As soon as he gets back into that sort of form that we know he can provide, something happens, injury happens, and and he was playing so nicely. You look, you look, you look, I, I, I can't believe they him in the at 11. I still, I still think of he's a 15th run through. But um, I just feel so bad for him. I just, he's so much talent there. He's so gifted. I just feel like he's one of those mm-hmm. you need to see him on the park week in, week out. Hmm. And, you know, I just there's something that I wanted to mention when you were talking about the, the Springboks and, and uh, sorry, the Sharks and, and how they're performing. The one thing, though, that, I will disagree with is the Sharks backline specifically are not the, 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 the Sharks side and the backline specifically look like they're almost locked in a closet when the Springboks are there, like they're completely ignored. But the truth is it's not the case. They, the, that backline is largely the same backline barring Penke who's um, who, you know, who play even when the Springboks are there. So it's bizarre. It's a mindset thing. Like, the, the midfield plays barring um, you know, um, the, the back three are, are playing, you know, uh, like it's just, it's bizarre. I don't, I don't quite understand it. But I think, you know, unless you want to add something more, but we could probably move away from that. And I don't think we've really answered any questions. And that's, the, the, that's kind of how a Shark supporter has been feeling the whole, the whole for two seasons now where you're expecting questions to be answered, but they're not. So it's going to come with time. But as I, I think, like perhaps um, Neil, uh, Neil Powell is going to need a good preseason with the guys, you know, start from new. But anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about the other confusing thing and the other upsets and within the South African setup, but the Lions beating the Bulls at Loftus. That's two losses in a row at Loftus, and Jake White's under a bit of pressure, don't you think? Yeah, something something's not right at the Bulls. I don't know what it is because I mean, we always give the Bulls the benefit of the doubt most of the season. Like, oh, they'll come right. Oh, they'll eventually figure out the base fifteen. Oh, like guys will come back from no, guys will come back from injury. And then unfortunately, Jack obviously got sick. But I just they've just been underwhelming this season. I think that's the and and, and, and Sandy kind of summed it up. Like that's actually been the season. Like it's just underwhelming and not what we expected. I, I should, like there were glimpses of off good performances, but overall I thought Saturday sort of summed up their their performance that just underwhelming, especially to the two games in a row and in, in Loftus. Um I mean, as a first of all was not, not not take anything away from the Lions. I know Rian No is probably still celebrating. That's why I was the pot today. <laughs> so so I know exactly. he, he's still he's still babbleless. Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, I think for the Bulls, yeah, just an underwhelming season. It's going to be tough for them to get in the end spot. But yeah, I think they, the Bulls are going to have a lot of questions to be answered come end of season. Um, I, I, I don't think anything will happen with Jake. I think this is his first probably, like in quotation marks, bad season to their standards he's had. Because, I mean, if you look at, if you follow anyone from the Bulls management on Twitter, they, they quickly remind you how many trophies they won. So, when I'm Strauss and we'll be saved from those tweets for a bit for until Eastern until They're very season. vocal, eh? <laughs> they're, they're very vocal. So they're, they're always all over social media. They are. Like, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, the Volus Strauss Coffee is trying to sack Jay Gordon. Man, we know the trophies. You told us you got all the trophies yeah. in the country. <laughs> so you better relax. Yeah, use it against back, him. Yeah, so back your coach now. Because if I'm Jake White, I'm not even like putting up um, stats. I'm just showing tweets from Volus Strauss. Like, well, we're looking at everything over <laughs> one, so you need call, when, you, need when you go down. for a performance review, you're like, you're like, but you said, <laughs> yeah, you said, so look at this, said, look at all this bling. Yeah, hundred percent. No, hundred percent. So and, yeah, I think Jake will, yeah, uh, Jake will be fine. Um, I think the Bulls will be fine. They're still quite out for just very underwhelming season. I think it's one of it's one of those ones. Just, you, uh, you know, what I mean, showing like some guys will leave, but I still think they've got enough youngsters and quality in the side to sort of still contend next year. It's still going to be Bulls, Sharks, Stormers next season. I think they've become the, they the Sharks are going to find something there. Because it's, yeah, it's sure. hard to pick up who's the second best. Huh? Those two, gotta, they got I think the Bulls have less questions than the Sharks. But yeah, both of those sides probably feel like they've sort of underwhelmed the season. 
on the topic of questions and underwhelming and all sorts of controversy, the Lions, after what happened in the last two weeks, after their performances and what's been going down and this whole crusade to, to sack cash, um, they, uh, they turned it around at probably that it's a statement performance by a side in it, that it wouldn't have had, it wouldn't have held so much punch had they done it anywhere else in the country doing it at Loftus in the XK Derby was, was a, was a time and a place to do something. And on Jacques Fruy's birthday, I might add, um, you know, what's going on there? What, what happened? You know, do you, do you think the sides have, have pulled together and, and now and decided like, we've got to kind of shake this shit off and, and, and just knuckle down a little bit and pull together as a team? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the Lions season has been a weird one. If you look at it, I mean, start of the season like a house on fire, we're thinking, oh, geez, the Lions, could actually, are they going to push a playoff spot? A cash fun run thing, all the mess happens in the middle of the season, then they fight with the boardroom. And then at the end of the season, well, t- at the tail end of the season, they seem to be fighting that form again. So <laughs> it's so hard to explain because, I mean, I'm just glad. I mean, I think the Lions, obviously, there's a few youngsters there that who are, that two are that two obviously have been a bit amazing this season. I hope those youngsters didn't play well because they tried to acclimatize themselves in Loftus and they can quit at home next season. So that's that's my <laughs> only my oh. only hope. Um, that's a great shot, lot, eh? Because yeah, well, all, all, the, all the sharks trials. So I mean, that's, that's it. Sort of feels like when they play against the sharks and the bulls, but it's what a win for the for the Lions. I'm glad they got it where they need that win. I, I just really hope that. They can build on this. I think if we can get all four of our sides purring and playing really well and contending, because if they if the Lions can contend as well and move their stadium from away from Ellis Park and play rugby in the normal area in Joe where we can watch them, um, I think they can be a, 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 another added force to the competition. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Let's just quickly go um, go over the results from from the weekend. So the rest of the URC stuff. So Glasgow Warriors destroyed. Zebra 58. Um, Warriors are very, very quietly um, gaining and building some serious momentum. They're fourth in the log at the moment. And I'm telling you now, they are going, when they're in the knockouts, be wary of them. I don't care where they're playing. Uh, if they're playing at home, you're in trouble, um, any side. Um, but if they're playing away, I reckon, I reckon they've still got a, an upset in them somewhere. So just be careful of them. Munster Scarlet, flipping hell. I couldn't believe it. Munster. This is the most dominant Munster I've been in ages. Um, just a, one shout-out besides the obvious shout-out, but John Klein has been incredible this season, and he really, again, had another great game. But Munster beating Scarlets 49-42, but I almost feel they were 49-0 up. That's how dominant they were. Scarlets made a comeback. But the most important thing, we don't care about the result. We don't care about anything else. The most important thing for Munster, we're doing this for you guys, lies. But for South Africa is Achis Neyman made it back. And I forgot how big he is. He is a bloody giant. No, yeah, no. And the haircut doesn't, um, doesn't, uh, d- 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 doesn't oh, help for the opposition as well. No, it, you know, it was amazing, amazing to, to have him back. Um, and I just, oh man, I just hope he gets through some games. The funny thing is with, uh, with Achim, I mean, not to look, not to look too, too far forward with the box. No one sort of cemented his the jersey left behind at 19 jersey in a 60 split or any cow. Like, and, and obviously, Moth is running the, the log series in the bench, but no one's sort of taken ownership. The moment always have, have been in and out, and uh, someone will ride. So, no one's sort of taken that out here. Zema, I suppose. He still kind of has a way to potentially sneak his way back into a box squad. O3 does get to some games. And uh, I don't know who's making more returns. Is it Arkes Neman? Or Tala to that one today's <laughs> podcast. Tala's been in and out and he's returning and he comes back. But the question is, Tala, do you have the Tala, same Tala, welcome Mohawk? back from injury. They have the same Mohawk <laughs> as Arceus <Archeus> Neyman. <laughs> and, and, and are you massive? No, unfortunately not. I'm not as exciting as uh, Arceus Neyman um, comeback. Yeah, I, oh, of I'm, course you are. We should have had, <laughs> we should have had, some, uh, we should have had some, some serious music to intro you in. We'll have to sort that out.
No, look, I think just more than for the box and for months, I'm just happy for him because this has been quite a, yeah, I can imagine how harrowing this road back to recovery has been for him and just, you know, all the injuries, the the fire ex- accident as well <laughs> from 2021, which don't think we talk about enough. Um, yes, see, it was brought up a lot on TV this weekend. Really? <laughs> yeah, no, I think everyone I mentioned that. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's good that he's actually back and he's playing and he's sort of, he's where he's supposed to be. And like on the other side of the coin, just seeing um, what's happening with uh, Lisi Haloholo with his injuries and just his just lack of luck. I think you can just see what was happening to Sneijman in the last few years happening to him of just, you're almost about to come back and now you suffer another injury. And I, yeah, he's been very open about how it's been such a toll on his mental health. So I can just imagine it's been similar for Sneijman as well. So. Hopefully yeah. he has enough to, I mean, first of all, hopefully he can just stay injury-free and then we can just build on those objectives after that. So if he can stay injury-free, obviously he can start being an influential part for Munster and this um, run to the knockouts. Munster's in a great position. They sh- could be even top four um, for the knockouts. And of course, they have a big match against the Sharks in Durban and having Sneijman in your team, even though they've lost Tug Burn for that match, I think... The the uh, I think Munster will fancy themselves even against a full strength Sharks Sharks team. So, yeah, uh, hopefully we can get to that stage. But I'm hoping he can just get some matches um, under his belt. Yeah, I I tell you that's that's big. And when he came on, he 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 played rugby. He 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 didn't dominate anything or anyone too much. And I I think he just went through the motions. Not saying that he took it easy. I just think he, I think he didn't overexert himself. I think he did what he needed to do. But I'm glad you you brought up Luisi Alaholo and everything, and we shared on social for all of those uh, those people um, who want to follow. He's put out a great thread. Um, I wouldn't say a great thread; it's a really informative thread, but a, a, a thread just explaining what's going on, how um, he's just suffered another injury, and then obviously in this current Welsh financial crisis, um, how he's made decisions um, was. What got offers? He decided to stay. Um, wants to do join. Wants to join the the one fifty club. Got offered a, another contract. He um, he got he got offered a poor. Um, like frankly, it, uh, by the sounds of things, it's a shit contract. He said that he can't uh, even really feed feed his family on it. He's got unfinished business with Wales. He really wants to stay and everything. He turned down uh, offers elsewhere, and now is hoping that he he can revive those offers. Um, and then now with another injury setback. So I tell you, it's a, it's a shit storm in Wales at the moment. And, you know, we just hope that all the players come out better than, than what they currently are, especially the guys that are injured, because obviously, um, you know, nobody really wants to, to get involved with a player that's injured. You don't want to be signing any contracts and stuff like that. So from all the rugby fans, we just hope it, hope it works out, but back to Munster, um, well, sorry, back to back to the rest of the results. So yeah, Munster Scarlets 49-42. Just who needs defense? Um, then um Edinburgh Leinster. So Edinburgh actually got off to a great start against Leinster. They ended up losing uh, 27-47 um at home to Leinster, which is kind of a score that you expected. But after the first 20 minutes, you didn't expect it. I thought Edinburgh went with the shot. <laughs> How silly of me. Um then uh, probably the game of the weekend is uh, Benetton beat Ospreys twenty twenty one in Wales, and that game sounds close. It was only close because of an Ospreys fight back, and they missed conversion to win the game at the end, which is gut wrenching for the home side. But another massive, massive result for Benetton. Um, Dragons were pipped at home by Connacht twenty twenty two, and Cardiff got drilled by Ulster 2042. Now, Ulster, incidentally, are mounting a little bit of a drive um, as well. You know, they're third on the table at the moment. So there's some interesting things on the horizon, but I think quickly, I can't see if anyone wants to say anything. No, they don't. Sorry about that. But just quickly going to go through the Stormers. Oh, you were. I apologize. That wasn't. <laughs> you didn't even put your hand up. How was I supposed to see that? You only did it now. It was a My sneaky apologies. one. Sorry, uh, but if I think there's just. Oh, I mean, I think you're going to talk about the the log. But can I just point out some matches? I think just for you know our 
trusty dirt trackers to to look out for for the next few weeks. So there's a yeah yeah. I was going to go through the fixtures, but go for it. Okay, go for it. Okay, no, so no, no, you're going to go, 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 go. Uh, yeah, you're going to probably do it team specific, but yeah, have a big hiatus with the rugby with the rugby championship with the URC until the 24th of March. But there's you know there's basically about 13 teams that still have at least a punter's chance of making the the knockouts. Probably realistically only live and up to the Lions and maybe Edinburgh have a chance. But there's also a lot of games that are going to be um, almost effectively knockout games in the next few weeks. You start with the big one in the in week 16, which is Leinster versus Stormers. So the Stormers could do the other South African teams a big favor if they let Leinster win, because Leinster will then secure the first place spot and first throughout the knockouts, which means Leinster will probably send their like F team to, to the South African tour where they play um, the Sharks and the Lions, which will hopefully give them a big boost in, in trying to qualify for um, the, the last 16. So Stormers win. I mean, Stormers loss there would actually be big a, a help for for the rest of um, for the rest of the competition, and it doesn't really have too much consequence for the Stormers because they have a, a lead, but not a big lead against um, against Ulster. Then Benetton Lions in that weekend becomes effectively a knockout game. Benetton's at ninth, Lions are eleventh. The Benetton's going on a South African tour in April, so they need to win this. And if they don't, they're out. And the Lions also need to win as many games as possible. Connacht Edinburgh also is basically a knockout game. Um, Edinburgh is probably their last chance to learn. They have to win against Connacht um, away from home, and they have an opportunity there. Munster Glasgow, we've just spoken about Glasgow, Sean. Glasgow is pretty much, yeah, this is probably going to be the the game that decides who's in fourth place. Munster's yeah, playing at home. Yeah. And this these teams are probably on a collision course to meet each other in the knockouts as well. And then Bulls Ulster, another game where it's third versus sixth, and that could also help decide um, what happens there. And in Bulls are seven, in trouble, eh? Bulls and Sharks Bulls are in serious trouble. Serious trouble. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when you and the lucky thing for the Bulls is that in week seventeen they've got Zebra coming to Loftus, so they can at least bank that. And yeah, they, careful, that obviously won't be. Hey, if the Bulls lose to Zebra, they don't deserve to be in the knockouts. I think that's the effective thing. The Lions will be hoping when, when we go back to the 15th of April that they have a weaker Leinster that they're facing. The Sharks are facing Benetton and hopefully they can kill them off. They'll be hoping to do that. And the Stormers in weeks, um, week 17 are, are facing Munster. Munster will possibly be playing in Durban in the 1st of April. And then if they beat the Sharks in Durban, they might have to fly either to France to play um, Toulouse or fly back to Thorman Park in order to play the Bulls in the quarterfinal of the, of the Champions Cup, and then come back to South Africa. So they might actually just maybe throw the game away and just stay in South Africa because they have two matches in South Africa after this as well. So logistically, this is not really a great time for Munster. So they have two big matches in South Africa after this, one against the Stormers, and then in the final week, they have a match against the Sharks as well. So Stormers against Benetton in Week 18, the the Sharks are playing Munster. The Bulls are playing Leinster and hopefully, hoping that not even Ross Byrne or Harry Byrne plays, but some other cousin Byrne that we don't even know about is going to play that game. And then for Connacht, I think it's going to be big because they might be able to secure all four Irish teams in the knockouts and they play Glasgow Warriors in the last game of, of Week 18. That might be the game that decides where the Connacht comes in and has other implications for the other teams as well. So, yeah, I think there's going to be quite a few games to keep to keep um, your eye on in the next few weeks. Yeah, so just a quick little run-up of how things work. So out of the um, out of the 16 sides that are playing, eight the top eight sides qualify for the Champions Cup next year. However, there are shields that are being run, a South African Shield and Irish Shield, Welsh Shield, et cetera, et cetera. Currently, there are no Welsh sides in the top eight. So the winner of the Welsh Shield, which is currently the, the sorry, the top of the Welsh Shield, which is currently Cardiff, who are in 10th, will effectively take that eighth spot of the Champions Cup. So from a South African point of view, the Bulls and the Sharks do not want to finish eighth. Eighth means nothing. It really doesn't mean anything. It means you go to the, the Challenge Cup. So, you know, they, they need to win. They, they need to win. So we're in for... Went for wild times, wild times. But um, 
For the second time today, I'm going to hand the baton over to Tyler, and you can you can take uh, take on on things for the rest of the of the chat. Mm, okay, so I've been resubbed on. Maybe it's a 20 minute red card from from the from Super Rugby. No, so speaking, no, of, I'll take it. I'll 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 H I A U and fail you. I hate those <laughs> things. I hate them. But Super Rugby had its Super Weekend this week. Um, this weekend, so I'm very. I mean. Typical Super Rugby games where there's a lot of points scored, a lot of flashy tries, and a lot of controversy as well. But I think there's only one place to start with Super Rugby, um, the Super Week, and that is the Adi Sevilla um, controversy. Um, lots has been said on, on 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 social media, but basically there was a fight. Guess who started it from the Hurricane side? Good old Dane Coles, and Adi was actually trying to stop it, at least in my opinion. And then in the stopping, he, he did fling someone. <laughs> he was trying to stop it, though. To be fair, but yeah, he, he did he body slam throw someone, flung down. someone. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> it wasn't a he. He threw them down. He he stopped <laughs> it in inverted commas by throwing petrol on the fire. <laughs> but yeah, so this all happens. The ref basically says that Adi was the main instigator for the te- for the fight becoming a big like team on team fight. And I he think that's rubbish. Him in a card. Yeah, and I don't think he yeah. was the main the main instigator for that. It's probably calls, and that's what I'm saying. The root of all Always. evil here is Dane calls. <laughs> yes. And as he's about to leave, um, it's Ryan Lawrence, right? The scrummer for, yes. for for the Rebels. <laughs> I don't know a what scrummer. he says. It has not been confirmed yet. What he says to Audi Severe, and Audi Severe, I think, has a decent reputation as. You know, obviously a tough rugby player, but a, a great guy, a nice guy in, in rugby. Like, you know, probably the closest in terms of what the New Zealanders have to a Sia Colisi type of figure. And then Adi yes. Sevilla looks at him and says, well, I'm going to get you. And then he's, he makes a slitting action with his, with, 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 on his throat as well. And obviously that causes a lot of turmoil on social media afterwards. Sean, I'll pass it over to you just to hear your thoughts and then Cooks and then, yeah, we can just discuss what the hell Rugby will do because he's now been cited for this action. I think we'll probably hear the decision um, probably probably before this podcast comes out. But yeah, I would like to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, I, I know Jared agrees that he should be cited. I don't agree. Um, just quickly, everyone is turning around going, yeah, but they do it in the hucker. It was banned or not banned or removed from the hucker a long time ago, like a couple of years ago already. So that's not part of the argument for me. I think, I think what he did was, a, and he freely, he admitted it at the end of the game and he apologized and he said it was just, it was wrong. It was a rush of blood to the head. I don't think like if he get he's getting cited, if he gets banned, I won't be happy. I, I don't, I don't agree with it. Um, I think if something else happens, like maybe, uh, in true um, world rugby fashion, like if he does a a fair pa- play course or <laughs> something like that, or whatever the case may be, but like I don't think that that warrants a ban. Um, not even under what is it? He what did they say? He was bringing the game into disrepute or whatever. I can't remember uh, under what law that they've cited him under. But yeah, I don't I don't agree with it. Nothing else came of it um on the field or afterwards or anything there was nothing that really happened and you know he he made a silly action uh and we all know that like it was not the greatest thing to do but yeah you know i think it's i think everyone must make a statement and say listen it's not cool we don't do that sort of stuff but i don't think it should be banned at all i think it just be should be made clear that we don't do that sort of stuff on on a rugby field but yeah i don't think anything should come of it really yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I do think he should have been cited. I think obviously because that the throw slit sort of has been banned. I think, yeah, I guess it's it's not a great look. Um, I know sometimes people in social media sort of fall for that trap of going, "Yeah, but he's a great guy, man. Like he, he's a great guy." Says, I'm like Audi. Like <laughs> I get it. Like it doesn't mean like if he does something and it it should be called to action. So what does it mean if like? If um, on Farrell does it, then it's, it's an immediate nine year ban or something because he's a great guy, quote unquote. Yeah, that's <laughs> like you see that. That's, <laughs> that's true, that, eh? That, if it was Owen yeah. Farrell. Oh, geez. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? 
for like 10 calls today. We're like, we don't be rugby again until next year. But I think it should be cited and I think it should be just talking to and not, I don't think it should be bad. I think they did handle it the right way. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's things like that. And we, it, it doesn't happen often enough to be like, oh, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a problem in rugby. It's like, like you get certain slurs that come up in games. You're like, yeah, if the guy says that he's got to go, he's going to get cited, things are going to be dealt with. But um, I thought the ref dealt with it well and, um, and um, Sanzo, or is it still Sanzo or, Whatever the wannabes and Kiwis are calling themselves these days. So my understanding is in order to be cited, it has to be deemed a red card offense. Well, it's not my understanding. I'm almost certain. So that means that they've cited him with the view that it shouldn't have been a yellow card. It should have been a red card. And that will then come with a ban. Now, I don't think that that is a red card offense. Although I agree with what you're saying. I agree... Like if he gets cited, so they are making a statement about it and he gets cited and they maybe say, listen, that wasn't, uh, it's a red card offense, but he showed remorse, blah, 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 blah. And therefore there will be no ban. However, in future, if anything like this happens, you know, we'll do it. But they also kind of need to set the precedent so we don't see shit like this daily, you know? So that's what I'm worried about. But it is a bit of a weird one. Like I really, the some of the, agendas and bullshit that came out on social media this weekend about it like oh he's inciting violence oh this oh that the one good thing that came out of it though when they were talking about it in in super sports studio afterwards was <laughs> john smith they were all talking about the the nines and john smith just said yeah there was a nine and uh and there and then nick mallet passed a comment about how nines are always causing trouble and john smith basically said if the opposition like your nine, you've got the wrong player. So that's <laughs> that was a brilliant, a brilliant end to to that. But yeah. No, it's good coaching advice from John Smith. Like you can't have a likable nine. <laughs> I think Antoine Dupont exactly. is pretty much the only exception. Or I don't know if you just hate him because he's good, but he's almost yeah, the only guy I can think of that is a relatively like not, you know, a shithouse nine, pretty much. Yeah, I think the one thing I want to say is <sighs> I know it's, yeah, I think it, it becomes dangerous territory, but like, obviously it's very difficult to liken one sort of unsportsmanlike conduct with another. But I, I also think in the sense that if, 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 if like Sean said, like if, if, if we just citing him to cite him and then that's the end of the punishment to say that this could have or should have been a red card and that's it, then I guess fair enough. But I also think like there's obviously no real malice from Savia. And maybe, yeah, maybe I'm a bit desensitized a little bit to that particular action. It's not like people do that and at least in that context and mean, hey, I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna kill you. You know what I mean? So and for <laughs> I'm sure people that have played um, you know, in the Western Cape or Western Province um club league, I'm sure Sean himself would have a few stories of people saying much worse and doing much worse to you in, in, in those club games. So, yeah, I do think this was completely... If that happened, if that happened in a club game, it, it is a red card offense because... You think so? Probably, they probably mean it and you probably <laughs> are going to get maimed. So, so, you know, now that you bring it up, um, you know, what are, we, what, are, what are we looking at? Like... Like, let's be honest, I think most places in South Africa, most places in the world, when you're playing lower, if you're playing in the lower leagues, like it's, uh, it's, either, it's either a drinking club with a rugby problem or it's a fighting club with a rugby problem. So, you know, there's, there's, there's that. <laughs> you know what, like, this is an odd thing. It needs like a, a that was like a, a cricket situation. Like in cricket, they just have dogged your match fees. Like dependent on what you do in the game, like they'll be like, if something obviously get a ban, is something severe, but they'll be like, you know what, you've got you know, time wasted, it'll take 25% of your match fee. Almost right, we sometimes do something like that, we're like, oh, you got a card, but like 25% of your ma- for half your match fee goes to a charity because it was an, an extra punishment. Like, there's no suspension taken away. There's, but sometimes, like, for me, it's in that gray area of between yellow and red. So, okay, I'm like, stuck. Just, like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure your players would be like, oh, don't go anywhere near match fee. I'm saying, Cricket sometimes does it well where they do fight situations where they just they just go ten percent of your match fee is gone, but obviously the level of what you do, I mean that's sort of I mean if you get a red card in cricket you must have done 
probably either thrown down by all the ball, but I mean, <laughs> but, the, but essentially, like, the, 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 the way you sort of do to punish, I think, rankings sometimes, especially the ones like this that fall in a gray area where it's hard to ban someone for some rankings, but also, like, you can't be like, hey, yeah, cool, it's all good, just walk away with the card, and that makes sense. Yeah, I like that idea, Cox. I think this was sort of prime for, and I think especially because Adi, and I don't think I mentioned in my summary, Adi did, at the end of the match, straight away acknowledge and apologize for his actions. I think that also just lowers the temperature down just to go, look, we can overlook this as long as it's off, hopefully a once-off, and we can just at least just be like, okay, 10% of your match fee, you can donate it to wherever, do a non-throw slitting class or whatever World Rugby does, and I think that should be the end of the matter. But yeah, I think it's one of those where if you're a fan of the opponent, I saw some wild Aussie takes about five, six-week bans and attempted murder charges and all that sort of stuff. And Yo, I was what? Like, you guys are the, are the literal competition that is basically trying to give reasons for not giving red cards for head contact. How are you guys more outraged about this than people having their heads hit intentionally i i yeah i that's where i was just like okay maybe it's good that we're out of that competition because i don't understand how this gets more heat than some of the still ridiculous tackles that we see every week in super rugby the best the best aussie tech i saw was he needs a three match ban it must be for the bladders lookups <laughs> i was like that's brilliant i can deal with that but you know the best part is is you know that Sevier and Lawrence had a beer after the game, and you know that he was like, "Listen, mate, I was out of line, but you deserved it because you're a mouthy nine, something like that." And that would have been it. Ha ha ha! Back slaps, have beers, talk shit. We'll see you next round, kind of stuff. Yeah. Like that's literally. I, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think it would have happened any different. He just totally would have been like, "You deserved that because you're full of shit," and he would have been like, "Yep, I did, <laughs> but you got carded. Catch you later." Yeah, yeah, I'll put rugby values. But moving on to things on, <laughs> on the field, uh, on the actual field, some interesting results um, in week two of the Super Rugby. I think we have, you know, the Crusaders thrashed the Highlanders 52 points to 15. Um, Hurricanes beat the Rebels in that game 39 points to 33. Chiefs beat Moana Pacifica 52-29. Waratahs beating the Fijian Drua 46-17. The Brumbies, probably the match of the weekend, beating the Blues 25 points to 20, and then the Reds absolutely pummeling the force to 71. 71. That's not a basketball score. 71 points to 20. That's not a Liverpool Man United score even. 71 points to 20. You know, and, and a liner and a liner 10. And having Tom Liner 10. Um, I'll just maybe I'll go to Cooks first for this. Super Rugby is back on being drunk pretty much and giving us Vasti Cup scores, but maybe just at least some form of analysis. I think I'd be, I'd be very happy if I was the Brambles right some, now. Some form of analysis. Yeah, I mean, what can you say about 71 points to 20? Let's like talk about the one game that wasn't a 50, 60 point thriller. I think the Brambles look like a, a decent team and I think the Blues are looking... I think we, we I think we know where the story is going to go with the Blues. Uh, I think this match um, on Sunday just showed us where, where this is going to go. Good regular season, and when it comes when the going is tough, the Brumbies or maybe or probably the Crusaders will probably knock them out. Sorry, Taylor, that's all the delay there. Um, yeah, I think, was, yeah, I think the the Brumbies <laughs> the, <laughs> fighting battles in his landed. The Brumbies um, probably do look the sort of. A form style, especially in Australia. I'm obviously I'm still a big I'm still a big Reds guy, um, but I think the Brumbies obviously they seem more likely to challenge the Australian and then the, the New Zealand sides. Who I don't know what's going on there. So I mean the Crusaders. I mean, obviously the Crusaders don't win games in February. They sort of take the they sort of take fame off. So likely maybe that's what the Crusaders are supposed for able to be the end of fame to start off with, as opposed to like the third week or or the second week of fame because they can get their loss in fame out the way quickly. But um, yeah, I thought, I thought just one, be, eh? <laughs> yeah, just one, Yeah, just get out quickly and we'll deal with the rest at the Port Islanders. But yeah, Super Rugby is chaos. But before I, 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 before giving analysis or instead of giving analysis on event, can they stop putting the Super Round in freaking Melbourne? No one cares about rugby in Melbourne. Can you put it like in Auckland <laughs> or Christchurch or Wellington? 
I'm so sick and, and tired of the problem with and Australia how hot. test in Super Rugby. It's first Thursday. It's first Thursday test. Now Super Rounds in Melbourne's <laughs> only come close to winning a <laughs> Super Rugby title. Why is it all? Of all places for the Rebels. Stop making games Super Rugby Magic Rounds in freaking Melbourne. Of all places. <laughs> the Australian Open. It's not the Ryder Cup. No one cares about Super Rugby in Australia. Oh, I was so annoying. <laughs> I was like, why is it Australia? Like, what's going on here? I hate the country so much. They don't deserve <laughs> rugby anymore. They don't deserve it at all. <laughs> oh, this is why I'm here. This is literally why I'm here for this. Cooks, uh, we need you more, mate. <laughs> Yo, the Cooks weekly Australian um, rant never fails to deliver. I'm assuming that it's basically because Melbourne has the most sports grounds there. I'm not so sure why Brisbane to, or yeah, if Brisbane or Sydney can't do it, but yeah, I, they're trying to make it the sporting capital of the world. Like that was that was literally what was being said all the time. Like this is the sporting capital of the world. Blah blah blah. <laughs> but like yeah, I, I I also don't get having it in the in the second round of the competition. You haven't even given the competition chance to get some momentum. Like it's, is yeah. it too early for something like this? But to be fair. To Super Rugby and to be fair to Melbourne, they did attend a lot better than they did last time. So it was more of a, yeah, it was more of a festival of rugby yeah. than it was last year. Last year was just, you know, some rebel family members and a few dogs came to the matches. Yeah, it. I, I remember last year that everyone was moaning like it just wasn't advertised. Then mm. obviously I don't know how well it was advertised there this year. But judging by some of the feedback, it wasn't the best. One thing I will say, though, is Stan Sports put a lot of time and effort mm. into um, going out and doing stuff. So what all the outtakes and everything they've got from the content they created this weekend will be used next year again. It was flipping hilarious. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. There was so much banter nonstop. Like there was, oh, I, I can't even remember. It was one of the guys was at the airport and there was a friend, uh, a French there was a Chiefs supporter coming in. He had like a Chiefs hat on and a vest on and they, and they asked him where he's from and and he was from the same place that Joe Wheeler was from, I think, mm. and, and he just said, he says, oh, um, how do you like your fish and chips? And he looked at him, he says, cooked. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's what we have for two. Like, that's brilliant. Uh, it, was, it was good banter, but uh, but yeah, let's let's see. But I agree with you, Tyler. Like, it would be lovely if it was maybe in round four or something when – you know, there was a little bit of spice going on. Um, now it was everyone still trying to kind of get get their head around the fact that it's super rugby time. Yeah, and like not all the All Blacks are back. I mean, some of the Wallabies are still being in integrated into the teams. Like, I think it's a good concept. I'd actually even love if the URC and other competitions did something like this. Just one weekend with all the games on one place sounds like a great idea. But it should be... That I, I agree think, with. I think yeah. it's brilliant. I, I think, think it should be brilliant. So it should imagine be they did it in gone. Yeah, sorry, Matt. I, I imagine they did it in in um in Carter for. Imagine they did it in Dublin. Yeah, but you know, like I think I think it's a great shot. I think I think that I think it's a great idea. Shit execution kind of scenario where if uh, you could definitely see the value in it. But uh, but yeah, we would love. I mean, the Premiership. The Premiership do something similar with uh um with rugby at Twickenham where they mm -hmm. all the all the London clubs um fight it out. To be fair, the the Welsh Welsh have um I can't remember what they call it. Um in I think it's called um, Day. Judgment Day or something like no, that. Judgment Day. That's it. I was gonna say execution day. <laughs> I was like mm, that doesn't <laughs> sound right. Enough. Judgment Day. Judge Judgment Day at uh, at Millennium or whatever it's called now, Principality. Like that's great. So if we did more more of that stuff. But it showed really well in preseason in Cape Town a couple of seasons ago where they played all the games at Cape Town Stadium. Mm. So if we did that in competition, it would be brilliant. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I think you've summed it up well. Like, good idea. Just they need to work on the execution. One negative of the Stan Sports thing is, I, look, I love my offloading Kiwi slash um, offloading center slash rugby league champ slash world heavyweight boxing champ commentator Sonny Bill Williams but oh my goodness 
it's 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 not he's not good at commentating or analyzing the game or i don't know it just doesn't come off well unfortunately i think he i think he adds value if you could chat about in-game stuff like he Mm -hmm. does pick up quite a few things but there is uh he he, he's better than he was last year so perhaps it was just a a nerve and a settling situation okay but i I think he's i think he's better but i love i love the (laughs) i love the pics of him sitting sitting there in his vest and Mm. he and he sends out a tweet going everyone wishes they they could at least wear one of these because (laughs) it was flipping hot there on sunday it was roasting man it was roasting can we talk a little bit about rugby because i want to talk about one player and i had completely forgot that he had been capped but gleason the eighth man for the waratahs I, I'm a listen. I'm a massive fan of um, of uh, that other guy with the big mustache, the other Lucy um, Gamble, looks, uh, the guy Gamble. I, I dig him. But Gleason at eight has been I, I, he's kind of grabbed my attention because whenever he carries, he seems to carry over the advantage line. He could potentially be a, a good shot for the Wallabies. I think he could play international rugby and he could be not shit at it. So I'd love to see what what Eddie Jones thinks, but. He's a flipping powerhouse at the back there. Mm. No, he's. I think he's really good. I think, I mean, number one, the Waratahs have a few selection, selection dilemmas in that loose trio. I mean, I'm still a fan of Will Harris. I think he's, I, mm. I was mm. wanting him to get um, Gleason's um, cap last year. I think he's somewhat in that like Harry Wilson type of like just baller type of number eight. But you can see why Gleason is, is favored in terms of just his physicality and his ability to get over the advantage line. And, you know, that's something that Wallabies traditionally have struggled with in the last few years. Yeah. And mm. I think the, the Waratahs would be a broad shout out. Sorry, a Seth is a broad shout out, but, um, oh, damn it. I lost it. Oh, Daniel Buerta, Dan Buerta, uh, tight head prop made his debut mm. for the Waratahs. Yeah. So I must be honest. I didn't uh, know too much about him. Also, another South African who played well this weekend, but uh, and I forget his name. But also, there was a South African playing for Connacht on the wing. Mm, played, uh, I think he might have played for UJ in Varsity Cup. But he was a he's a big he's a big lad. Sorry, I'm I'm like a pinball machine. I'm bouncing all <laughs> over the show. Apologies. No, just my last at least super rugby take. Cooks, you can jump in if you have anything else. Is I think yeah, we'll have to see how you know, like what will happen and how Super Rugby Pacific goes in the next few weeks. But I think we're, we have a similar type of like division of sort of the tiers of teams. I think Crusaders, Brumbies and and um, Blues will be sort of near the top. And then it's just a matter of do the Waratahs and Chiefs try to join that club or are they in that second tier with maybe the Reds and the Hurricanes? And then I think the bottom tier, hopefully the Fijian Drake can get out of it, but the bottom tier is then Fijian Dra, Moana Pacifica, the Rebels, Force, and Highlanders. They are probably going to be the ones fighting for that last playoff spot. Yeah, it's just a matter of maybe the Waratahs will maybe not be as good as we thought preseason because they've lost Angus Bell for the season, or at least for the Super Rugby season, which is, I think, a big loss for the for the Wallabies as well. But And the Reds won't probably have um, Taniela Tupo for a lot of the competition as well. So We'll have to see how the Australian teams do when they inevitably get injuries. But I think the hope for Australia, if they want to go far and, and even just appear in the finals, the Brumbies going um, going all the way through. I think, um, yeah, I just I think your takes are spot on. I've got one, the last one super big take. I've, I've, seen, I've seen it a little bit, but now, now I'm, I'm st- I'll stand by it. <laughs> Richard Wong is the Richard Wong is a super big goal. I, I don't want to hear anything else. I know Dan Carter is amazing. I'm not saying that he's better than Dan Carter, but Richard Moore is the greatest, arguably the greatest flower of, to have played Super Rugby. Like he, he ripped the, mm-hmm. he was ripping the, I mean, I mean, anyone can rip the highlights to shares at the moment, but six titles, just like he's probably going to go past, so he might go past but Carter and Pauls, but just the own Super Rugby. Like it's his competition. It's like, it's, it, it's a joke what he does at times in Super Rugby and the Crusaders obviously Precisely crusading, but that's my change about Spring because I guess Wong is the best. He, he's the best ten the commissions ever seen. No, I fully agree with that. I think he just makes this competition look too easy, and I think that's where and, and re, I think justifiably so. Like, why a lot of people rate him is just that when he gets on that field in that red and black jersey, like he just 
creates magic for them. So he's, it's no surprise that he's back to his best form. Um, let us do a little bit. We'll touch very quickly on just a bit of Saffirs abroad with, you know, two fly-offs doing really well in England. And then we can finalize with just a bit of Six Nations chat. But Sean, I'll, I'll give you the floor. I think there's been some good encouraging performances on on one side for Andre Pollard, just stringing together some great matches now for Leicester. And then on the other side is Rob Dupria just refusing to, you know, let you down in your Rob Dupree agenda as well. <laughs> yeah. Actually uh, mentally prepared a little bit of a, of a chat around this, but, but yeah, we, uh, Pollard is hitting form at the right time and, and he had some great numbers this weekend, but he really, he fits into what Tigers want out of a 10. And I think that's great because we need Pollard to be on form in that kind of style, in that kind of setup, because it's very similar to what we need from him for the Springboks. Um, it is a World Cup year and Pollard is is needing to be there. Rob Dupree, if, if I had to give you a list, I'm going to run through three lists quickly. If I had to give you a list of, of current form tens that are that can qualify that can play for the spring box rob dupree would be number one number two would and i'm talking kind of long-term form it would be rob dupree manny lebock um and then it would be between um probably between pollard and yanchis if i had to give a short-term form on who's playing the best it would probably be pollard number one rob dupree and then and then manny um, or Rob Dupree and Manny can swap around, but Rob's been cooking. And then over over a longish, a longer period of time, Manny would probably be first choice. But um, we are in a great position at Flower. I don't, with everything happening at the moment, like I'd, it all depends on what you want to do. Do you want to have a Springbok experienced second uh, second Flower half? In which case, then Alton Yanchis is going. He is playing for Arjen. He's played the last four weeks straight. Um, you know, he I haven't watched, but his stats haven't looked too bad. So, you know, he's getting game time, which is what we want. But Pollard is is cooking at the moment. I think as things stand, Pollard's a first choice 10. And then you must decide, are you going to take Lubbock because he's um, in Cape Town based, South African based is probably where the favoring, the swing vote will come. Or do you give Rob Dupree a shot? to have a little look, see how he's, he's changed his setup. But we're in a good place. Yeah, some form teams um, playing quite well in, in Super Rugby. I mean, <laughs> playing well in rugby all over the world right now. And Cooks, there seems to be a rumor that Alton Yankees is one of the players that's been asked to um, join the Springbok training squad at the moment. So, I mean, it's clear that he's now just been playing, I think, for at least for a month, if not more, for Ajin. And he's just putting at least over. some performances in. Yeah, and he's at least able to get some consistent performances. So I think I saw your tweet saying that you still convinced that he's still the best number two option for the box. I just want to send a message to all box fans right now. Whether you hate Elton, especially those who don't like Elton, brace yourself. If he's fit, if he's playing the rugby, he's going to the World Cup. Get your anger out of the way now. Vent now, whatever. Make, it, make your dietitian jokes now. Get them out your system. This is going to the World Cup. If Elton is fit, he's not. I just don't see him see the coaches put him away to the side and and not picking him. I mean, I still trust him. And I I still am all for experience. Tyler, you made a great point. I saw on your tweet that said that you wish those France and Devon Williams and Williams in the rugby championship went to Marnie Lobok. I completely completely agree with you. I think with Marnie, there's two little games, two little bot games this year to give him to sort of trust him and give him that second 10 role. I worry with, and Damon Williams, uh, I don't like the fact that sometimes you may need to use three kickers like you're playing on a 15B Derby Day game against Glenwood. Um, so <laughs> I just feel like you know, you do need uh, Alton Yankee's experience. He's been there. I can't think of anyone better to, to, as, as Comfort Pollard. So that's, that's my thing. So Bok fans, you can be angry about it. You can tell me. You can tell me the dietitian stories. You just brace yourself. Like when you, you might watch Odd Matthews not be able to sing the national anthem again when they announce the box squad on live TV, but it will be there. That's probably the, the controversial thing we'll only see. I am a hundred percent with you. 
the the big thing for me is what do you want out of your second choice 10 in the Springbok squad going into a World Cup? He's not going to play. He's not going to get a lot of minutes. So for for everyone that's like we want, we, we need a Libok or we need uh, whoever, not going to get a lot of minutes. That person is there for prep and everything. You, if you want to tell me that Yanchis adds zero value, then you've got to you've got to watch Chasing the Sun again. <laughs> you know, you've got to see what he does in the in 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 the sort of broader squad setup and everything. He's well experienced in that. Um, if everything if he's fit and everything's smoothed over with what happened, uh, I'm I'm with you. He goes. Um, if uh, the you know if we look at what value um, other guys will add, like they'll add a lot, but they're not going to get a lot of game time. So that's the thing. We probably will settle. I don't want to have Willem say as a second choice fly half because uh, in the squad, like named as a second choice fly half, because we're not going to then see him. And for me, Willem's a start. So in that way, he must be named as a 15 or a utility player. And he will probably shift in a lot of 10. You can have Pollard starting at 10 you can have Willems starting at 15 and they can then they can take Pollard off put Willems to 10 and we can have a 6-2 split even if we go 5-3 because we've been more partial to doing 5-3s lately if we go 5-3 that means that Willems will then be benched and we don't want to see that and there's no ways we're going to start a Pollard bench a Lubbock and then have a Willems starting as well I don't see that happening long term especially with what we what the way we normally play. So um, unless, of course, everything totally changes and we now go back to the 5-3 just when everyone else got used to the 6-2 um, and just really throw another cat amongst the pigeons. But I agree with you, Cooks. I'm, I'm, I'm on that. I'm on that. I've, 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 I've got lots of those stocks, mate. I know you talk about stocks a lot. I've had those stocks for a long time. I've, I've been keeping his name alive. I always mention him because I, I think he will add value. And, and, and Sean, the thing is, like, I think for now, I mean, it's been what, since, let's say, that the Jacques and Rassi, I mean, six and regime, I mean, since about 2018. And the one thing they've showed us in the five, the six, six years they've been in charge of the spring boxes, once they have their players that they trust, they don't, they, they don't tend to go away from those goals unless, barring a, a, a massive loss in form or, Injuries or something big happens, but they trust Elton. They know the job that Elton has to do at the World Cup. It, they don't, like you see, he's not going to play every game, but they need him in the training sessions. They need him mm. if they're going to play a 5 3 split. Maybe they're like, flip, maybe someone like Pollard, we, we might even take Pollard off early and we can, we can throw in a, a Damien at, at 15 and maybe we need an Elton. Like you said, there's so many options. Elton at 10, Damien goes to 12, uh, Willem said, like, there's so many ways I can skin the cat, and, and Alton allows him to do that. Also, left footed kicker. All those things play a massive role into how the box not playing. I, I think the minor box is just not enough games for him to unseat Alton in that second flower spot. And I think it just shows, for example, him playing a month in Argen, and they really want to bring him back to camp. They, don't, they want to have a look at him. And if he gets through this camp and then a good look at him, that's all they need to hear. So that's my thing is the money minutes that. He could have played this year. I think we'll go to Elton. I think Elton will start a few games, start more games than we expect in the rugby championship, sort of get him up to speed. But Elton's going to the World Cup if he's fit and rearing to go. I think people need to sort of find a way to to to, to accept that. Yeah, I'm um, I'm I'm with you. I think also I I love these I love these alignment camps. I love um, I love the shitstorm it creates when we have these alignment camps and the what the what about and oh he should be a, he's cuck what's he doing there blah 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 oh yawn um it is exactly that just to get everyone up to speed see what's going on have some face time with the players and the people find out what sort of headspace they're in elton was always going to get a comeback unless unless whatever happened and what was said was uh, irreparable which it doesn't seem to be the case Elton was always going to be in with the mix. I think it was very clear. I think the communication was there to everybody as well. I think it would have been a case of, Elton, you need to go get game time. We will look at you, and then we can take it from there. And that is what has happened. If I'm really, if, I'm, if I have a look at the future and think about a future where Yanchi is not in the mix for this World Cup, 
And let's say Libok definitely is the front runner to take that second 10 jersey. If Pollard gets injured, I wouldn't be surprised if they send out an SOS to uh, Mornay Stain and Mornay Stain leapfrogs uh, Libok and starts. And that will cause even more of a shitstorm. And, and it's only because of one thing and one thing only is the, the lack of Springbok game time that Libok has had. If he just had had at least another 8, 10 games, I would be in ecstatic. We'd be singing a different song. But uh, yeah, so. But on that, Libok does kick left footed. He kicks both. But I was super impressed with his kicking out of hand with both left and right feet, swapping it up. I mean, that's ridiculous. I can just barely stand on my non dominant foot. I think that's a really good analysis, guys, of the fly off situation. And then finally, we can then just look forward to week four of the Six Nations. Um, we've had a bye week. We now are going to the home stretch, last two weekends, big weekends, I think, for all six teams. And this weekend's games are all interesting for many different reasons. You have probably the wooden spoon decider between Italy versus Wales on, on, on starting us off. We've just heard the news that Ange Capozzo is going to be is ruled out for the rest of the Six Nations with a shoulder injury. So unfortunately, Italy won't be able to rely on their absolutely fantastic player in Capozzo. But will they be able to still beat Wales with without him? They're playing in Rome. Wales will be looking for revenge from last year. And Wales, I mean, as um, Sean and Jared discussed last week, they have some positives, but there's so many questions to answer. France versus England as well. Le Crunch happening in Twickenham this Saturday. England fancies their chances. I'm not so sure why, but I think France is probably still the team to go for, even though they have two tight head props in, in suspension right now. Then Sunday, Ireland versus Scotland. We'll see now if Scotland can win the Triple Crown and whether Ireland can... Uh, yeah, this is going to be the big game for, for, Scott, for, for Ireland if they want to win the Grand Slam playing away. So. Sean, I, I, we can let's do just a very quick preview on, on of, of the games, and then we can do predictions at the end. I'll, Sean, I'll ask you to talk about Italy, Wales, and England, um, France, and then Cooks can obviously talk about Scotland, Ireland. Right, um, Italy, Wales. I'm very, very interested to see what happens. Um, I think Wales will be a little bit tighter, might be a little bit less erratic. Um, but they're going to have to wear Italy down. The thing with Italy, if you keep them in the mix, they will will burn you, and they're totally looking for a back-to-back win over Wales. Mm, I'll have to think about that prediction, but we'll do them at the end. England-France is... Uh, I'm thoroughly looking forward to it. Again, I think England have been building slowly but surely with a few things, and it's got to come together now. England... France, Scotland, and Ireland are all in with a chance to win the Six Nations. So come round four, we have four sides that are still able to win it. We are in for a massive weekend of Six Nations right now. Oh, massive game. Do you know what, Tim? Uh, I, I just feel like Ireland should do me a favor and just let Scotland win. I mean, what, imagine the world would look like if Scotland wins the Six Nations. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a, I call it glorious. That's what the world looked like, glorious. <laughs> Finn Russell at Six Nations champion. Were we alive when they last won it? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> well, I might have. I might have been alive. You guys wouldn't have been. <laughs> no, I, uh, I think. I think it's going to be um, uh, a massive, 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 um, massive game. Um, I, I actually think, uh, if I'm Ireland, it's not sound man, but if I'm Ireland, I don't play Sexton again this weekend. I think you've got to put Ross Byrne in the fire in a massive game again because I, I genuinely think that's. The missing piece that Ireland has going to the World Cup is who's going to, what happens if Sexton gets injured? And the fact they're playing the box and Scotland in their pool, I think the World Cup for them is more important. And it's an injury pool momentum, obviously, but have, someone, have Sexton on the bench. But um, I, I, but as good as Scotland's, the story has been, I do see Ireland winning that game. I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be a very, very good attacking game. So I'm, so I'm very, very keen to watch it. But yeah, I read Ireland's going to, I think Ireland's going to go to Murrayfield and leave with a win. It's too good. Okay, it's time to now back this up with predictions, guys. So let's start with Italy, Wales. Sean, I'll ask you, then Cooks, and then I'll go. So Italy versus Wales in Rome. Wales by four. Ooh, okay. Cooks? Italy by two. Yeah, I'm stuck between sticking with my 
um, pre-tournament prediction, and now the Kapuza, um news has made me very nervous. And yeah, like I think Sean and Jared discussed last week, I don't think Wales is actually that far off. I think they just need to really just go back to basics in some ways. But yeah, what the hell? Let's go Italy. Let's go at least one win for them. Yeah, let's the wooden spoon must be shared by other teams as well. So let's let's have Italy get out of the, the basement there. Then La Crunch. Cooks, I'll start with you here. England versus France in Twickenham, Saturday evening. France haven't won in Twickenham since 2013, if I'm not mistaken. I I think so, yeah. The Steve Borth with coming out parties happening this weekend, England by three. Ooh. Ooh. I am also going England, actually. And here I was thinking I was going to rock the boat. <laughs> um, I think France have slowly but surely been kind of on a little bit of a downward curve, very, very slight. They, they're kind of dropping off. And I think England by five, this is, this, is, this is that game that makes everyone sit up and take notice of England. The conversations around, is it coming home? will start again. It will line up next weekend's um, uh, Ireland, England uh, on St. Patrick's Day weekend for, for what I'm thinking will be the, for, will, will, will be the title. So I'm going England by five. Yeah, you guys are crazy. It's definitely going to be France. Um, <laughs> but, sorry, that was that was that was pretty confident. But how much? But how much? Like, no, 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 if you're that confident, it'll be close. It'll be France by like six or seven. But France is winning this game. I think France's like rumors of France's demise have been greatly exaggerated, especially with the island game. I think they pretty much went into the wrong game plan, trying to appease their fans and trying to play, you know, like wide. Um, play sort of a, a, a ball in hand type of approach and it bit them obviously in the bum there. But then against Scotland, what they did was they went through the middle the whole time and they just did the pick up and goes and the pods and all that sort of stuff. And yes, England's defense is a lot more physical um, in some respects, but it can still be manipulated because they're still learning the Kevin Sinfield system as we saw against Scotland and as we um, saw at times against Italy as well. So I'm backing France to win. I think... Um, um, Falatea, who's been deputizing at tight head, he's been great, and I think he deserves a start, and he'll do well. Um, I'm sure some other big French tight head guy is going to come in and 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 do at least a job there. So, I yeah, I can't see England winning. I think England's going to show some progress, but I think it's still too early for them to take that next step. Um, and I think that means France will then put themselves at least in contention for for the. For the grand, uh, for, not for the grand slam, but for the Six Nations next week. Then finally, I don't, uh, let's start with Cooks, just so you can get the obvious prediction out. Scotland <laughs> versus Ireland in Murrayfield. I did say my other take that Ireland was going to win, but you know what? I take it all back. I take it back. Scotland <laughs> by three. Yes. It's happening, guys. Finn is going to take me to the promised land. Finn and I are going to... Uh, if, if Scotland do win the Six Nations, whoever, all Finn haters, oh. all the Finn haters and the new, the, the new Finn fans who've jumped along when, who went there when I was fighting a lonely battle, you guys as well, you better block me because I'm, I'm, I'm having my own bus parade. I'm having my own parade all around the country. I'm going to be wearing a kilt. I'm going to be wearing... You're going you're gonna, you're gonna to have your... Level. Open open top bus trip all the way to Ellis Park for when Russing play the Lions, right? You're gonna do 100%. like a full full week and a half trip up there <laughs> from from Cape Town. You must do the whole the whole length of the country, and then you can end at Ellis Park. And Russing ninety two won't even send him. <laughs> exactly, it's fine. I, 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 I ask for a Zoom call. I'm saying the stars are aligned. I just because it, it's going to be Italy next week. The stars are aligned. It's happening. It's happening, boys. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm going with I'm firstly Sexton starting. I don't think they don't start him in this game. Um and especially because he's had a week off already. So he does start. And I think Ireland are going to bore everyone to death by playing very, very, very tight rugby, not giving Scotland any chance. And Ireland are gonna win comfortably. They're gonna it's going to be a slugfest and Scotland are not going to stop because they don't and they always find a way back into the game. But I think Ireland are going to bore them to death, kick them to death 
and Ireland by probably 12. Cooks, I love you, but I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, Ireland's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Ireland bonus point win. Um, they, <laughs> do, they, 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 I think... I think we are going to now have the annual Finn Russell where is he game that always happens in the Six Nations <laughs> when Finn Russell fans oh, are getting a bit word. too confident for their boots. And yeah, no, I'm willing to um, cop all the abuse if, 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 if Finn Russell does prove me wrong. But I can... He's yeah. going to have the where is he game and then followed by, by um, a, a ban that will only be lifted, an, an internal Scottish ban that will only be lifted just before the World Cup. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> no, we, we know what the, how the story goes. Um, um, I, I, I can <laughs> just see that there's going to be some form of like, you know, something happening. All the Scottish players that have been being hyped for the last few weeks will just be nowhere. Hugh Jones won't be able to run through anything. Finn Russell will be nowhere. Stuart Hogg will have one of his disaster classes. He'll look like, you know, just like a, a, a Scottish like Captain Norman Keys. No, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. And then we'll have, and then we'll have um, a whole week of, oh my gosh, Scotland, they've fallen down. And then next week, they probably just scrape a win or even lose to Italy. And Finn Russell's banned for, I don't know, drinking the whole of, of Murrayfield Dry or something like that. So, for, not atten- for not attending one training session. Something like that. <laughs> like Scotland has to prove it to me. I, I want to get on the Scotland hype train. I want to be there, but I've been burnt before in 2021. I've been burnt in 2022. I'm not going to believe it until I see it. So Scotland has to do the things, but I don't think this is a bad thing if they get beaten by Ireland. Ireland's literally the best team in the world and they're going to win the Grand Slam. So Ireland by about 10 and yeah, bonus point win for them. Tell her, don't. I, I, I'm hoping Scotland has that um, that Finn Russell disappearance game in 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 September when they play us. So not, I'm, I'm hoping they, they, they get all the hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. out. <laughs> I've got tickets. <laughs> I've actually got tickets for that World Cup game. So Finn better oh, yeah. cook there because <laughs> I'm paying I'm paying euros to see some good rugby. I don't even care if the box win. I want to see good rugby. So whoa, every whoa, player whoa, must whoa. play well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so you, the- you are you are about to get red carded, and there's no twenty minute red cards in this system. No, that, that Scotland game is Sean, massive for our World Cup hopes. Don't you very dare, Sean. The, the, a lot of money is being spent to basically go to this game. I'm going to this game and the box Romania game. I'm not going to see good. Yeah, rugby so you happy? You have you happy to see the Springboks knocked out just because just because Finn's playing? We we really no, we need can, to talk, Cooks. We we'll must take this Ireland. offline, eh? <laughs> yeah. We'll beat Ireland. We just got, I just want to. I don't want to see. I don't necessarily want to see Scotland win. I just want to see everyone have good form. Like I don't want to see the Scotland where oh where where the big players. Oh my gosh, Hamish Watson has missed another. I was going to say he can he can have a good game and still lose. I'm okay with that. But you <laughs> you weren't singing that song in the beginning, eh? No, you, I was saying you weren't. Fit better cook. He better cook if I, if I'm going to go watch him live. But yeah, uh, Scotland's going to have their their usual dip. And then, yeah, we'll have, I think, a big, this is going to be a big Six Nations weekend. I think all six teams have, yeah, a bit of narrative to win here and a big chance to, 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 to establish that. And then very quickly, Jess, before we end off, who's your current Six Nations player of the tournament? Sean? Wow. Um, it would probably be Hugh Jones. Yo, what? Oh, I didn't expect that, actually. <laughs> Out of... Out of, I, I, in form and how he's been playing, it'd probably be Hugh Jones, but um, you can't go wrong with uh, Josh Van der Flair either. But I, I think right now the person that is making the most waves would be Hugh Jones. Mm, okay. Cooks? It's so hard to go against um, Kalen Doris for me. I think he's arguably, um, him or, or Gary yes. Ringo, they're probably playing the best rugby in the world at the moment. Um, it's just in terms of in terms of players, um, so yeah, I think yeah, I'll probably lean towards uh, uh, Kalen Doris. I mean, I love the um, I love the Hugh John shout. I mean, Hugh Paludu, those two have been amazing, but it's kind of very hard to look past uh, Kalen Doris. No, I like those shouts. I'll Tyler. also throw in. I mean, Anton Dupont. It's basically his award. He pretty much owns it now. Um, he'll always be in contention, and then um, Hugo Keenan. I think will be. 
a very good shot for this as sure. well. He's he's been playing rugby, eh? <laughs> I, I, remember, do you remember Ireland were like, oh, they're like, oh, Jordan Lama is the answer at mm, 15. Mm. You know, they haven't really been able to replace Kearney. And then all of a sudden, like, Lama, um, uh, oh, excuse me. Him. <laughs> Hugo Keenan, Hugo Keenan has been, uh, has been cooking. He really has been solid. He's essentially made that 15 jumper his, like, mm-hmm. just by just going through the motions. And I mean, yeah, like I think he's almost like a supercharged version of what um, Rob Carney was giving to Ireland of you'll get exactly what you pay for in terms of just being a solid fullback. But Keenan, just his ability with just picking lines for, for um, to run off players from, I think him and Hugh Jones are probably the two players I would like to lead some sort of like class on like what, how to pick a line to run into because they're just brilliant at making attacking opportunities in 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 broken play, yeah. I think Heenan has just really been good, and I think Warren Gatlin probably wishes he was <laughs> available. He he showed this form a year earlier, so he can have picked him in this in the Lions tour, um, because yeah, I think he would have liked to not have had to pick um, Stuart Hogg, but I uh, I'm very <laughs> sorry. I I can't resist. He did have a great game against Scotland. I mean against France though, but yeah, I think Hugo Keenan has just been. What you get from him is just really, really, really like good, you know, running ability, defense. He's really good with that. His passing, his kicking was amazing in the France game. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how he does in the last two rounds. But I think the the club lead at the moment is Kalen Doris. He's just been massive in those games. And he's, you know, he's almost like what happened with Josh van der Freer last year of you just note his impact the more and more that you watch him. And mm-hmm. I have a small theory that these Irish players are wearing these scrum caps on purpose to make them even more noticeable with what they're doing. I think this is actually yeah. what, how they're trying to get these World Player of the Year, Player of the Tournament um, awards. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Kalen Doris is a great shot. I can't, I can't argue that. And, and the one thing that is probably a, a swing vote that you can't really do with many other players, but he can play at the back or on the side of the scrum. And it's been quite, uh, if you search social media, you'll see how the analysts have been picking out how his game changes, how he can play a tight or a loose game. Mm. So that is exceptional. The, the talent, that, that is, is supreme talent to be able to do that at test level, um, you know, granted and taking nothing away from him, but granted it is easier when the Irish machine is is purring the way it is. But you, I can't argue with that Kellen Doris definitely definitely leading at the moment and i think we can wrap up a bumper rugby bits um, podcast on that sean thank you cooks thank you so much for your, all your contributions and your takes and some analysis thrown in there for good measure thank you for also um, playing with one man down for a lot of this podcast as well you dealt with those two yellow cards quite well i think um <laughs> yeah, I think you you handled the ball the, the the game well. You were doing some tactical kicking. You made sure things went on even without me. So thanks for that, Sean. We had to slow we had to slow the game the game down a little bit just to run the clock. You know, <laughs> scrum scrum reset, kick for a line out, and then the last bit we had to kick for poles, which took ninety seconds. So <laughs> we just just made it. No, it's and, touching, guy. And thank, thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much to everyone listening. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for another classic edition of, of the Rugby Birds podcast. Um, please support us and, and, and all your podcast providers. Like, share, subscribe. Just make sure that this podcast is shared with the rugby world. We will hopefully have a lot of um, uh, editions and episodes to look forward to in the next few weeks as we wrap up the Six Nations, as we get to the business end of all the domestic competitions. So look out for those. And yeah, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll, have, we'll chat to you next time. Bye-bye.